well. Okay, so the great vowel shift is a very important topic, I think, if you're an English major. So this is kind of a class that would be oriented to people who are more upper division in the English major. Obviously, it would not be for, you know, just starting off. But it's a topic that I think is important because it helps you understand more of the, the depth of the linguistic history of English. And so I think it's it's a good thing to to talk about. No, so so what? So what is the uh, great vowel shift, and why why should we study this? Well, the great vowel shift is going to be, as we will see, a, a, a series of vowel changes that's happened in the English language. It happened over about three centuries, from the 15th century to the 18th century, and by understanding this uh, shift, I think it helps you to understand better English spelling as well as be able to read the words more fluently and understand them better. And I also think that uh, knowing the, the Great Vowel Shift is kind of like, for a biologist, knowing natural selection. It's just a basic, if you're an English major, it's a basic thing that you should, at some degree, to some degree, understand. Also, a, a side benefit will be able, you'll be able to decipher and figure out how to pronounce Old English, or not Old English, but Middle English poetry a little bit better. You'll be able to figure that out, so like Chaucer and so, so on. So this was discovered by the linguist Otto Jesperson in 1909. And Otto Jesperson was one of the greatest English linguists that um, has ever lived. And he discovered this not too long ago. So it's, you know, a little bit over 100 years ago, reflecting on what has happened with English spellings over the centuries. So in order to understand the whole concept of the Great Vowel Shift, we need to first understand something about Late Middle English, and particularly about the vowels. So in Old English, actually, there were only monophthongs, and that also carried on into Early Middle English. In Late Middle English, you actually started to develop diphthongs. But, so what is a monophthong? So a monophthong, very simply, is just a simple vowel, a single vowel, mono being one, and not more than one. So diphthong being more than one. So I'll give examples of diphthongs in just a little bit. But first, let's look at these monophthongs that were in late Middle English. So we had E, as you can see here, and A. These are front vowels. They're also closed vowels, so that meaning that your, your mouth is generally more closed and your tongue is high, so that's why we'll also call these high vowels. So for words as seaton, which, which is now the word sit, we say sit in English, modern present day English, whereas in Middle English you would say seaton. In the, for the word which we now pronounce as set was satan, uh, for the word for cat was pronounced with the central vowel, cot. And for the back vowels, you had oo and o. So like as in full, what we would now pronounce as full was pronounced fool and flock, which was pronounced as floak. You also had long versions of these. So those were the short monophthongs. Now you also had long monophthongs, the front ones being E as in Biden, A as in Saken, E as in Leiden, and you can see the English, modern present day English translations of those words here. The central vowel A, which extends for the word Machen, which is the word today make. You also had the back vowels U, O, and A. So you had U for Hus, which is now house, O for Bok, which is now, of course, book, and a for home, which is now home. Diphthongs, we had a number of those, and there was at least seven in late Middle English. And what has probably, what, how these arrived, different than the Great Vowel Shift, which we will get to in the next slide, uh, they probably came from consonants that were gradually weakened and then vocalized. So the E vowel that came, comes in series is like a and I, um, or sorry, I and A, um, came from the palatals, um, these palatals, and U came from the velars. 
So you had o, 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 u, o, o, and o, i, and a. So with um, o, I'll just give one example. You have like the word what we would say claw today. In Old English, that, that was clawa, which, which became clawa, which is where you get um, in Middle English, you get the, something like clow. Okay. Uh, so that would be now today a, a monophthong. We say claw, which is a lengthened ah vowel. Whereas in, um, of course, in Middle English, that was a diphthong, that was clow. Okay. Ow, two vowels put together. Also, we have uh, a, a diphthong actually that's carried to today, but we we um, we actually say it, pronounce it differently for the word gray. So we say a gray. Okay. Well, that came from gray. Gray became gray. Gray. Okay. Gray to gray. And gray now is gray. So that's a dip, an example of a diphthong that we've continued, but we pronounce it differently. Now with the, um, the great vowel shift, GSV, we see that there are, it affected the long monophthongs. So we just d demonstrated what those were. Now we're going to see how these changed. So here's the seven that we've seen before. I won't uh, linger on this because we've basically talked about this in the previous slides, but these are the ones that were affected. And there's two main changes that have happened. So the first change is, well, it's not necessarily in this order, but let's just put these out here as the two different changes. There's diphthongization, so becoming a diphthong. So there's two vowels, which you will see that became diphthongs. And then there's vowel raising. And raising meaning that either the mouth becomes more closed, which in each situation actually the mouth does become more closed, and the tongue becomes more raised. So that's kind of the raising. Okay, so here's just a quick overview of what happens and then we'll go into the details. Now, um, as you can see here, I'll focus on just a couple of vowels. So here's an example of raising. So this word here, which we say beat now in modern English, which is, of course, in Chinese, it's tian cai, right? It's a, it's a very purplish colored uh, vegetable that has a lot of sugar content, in it, but it's still quite good for you um, in moderation. If you say this word now, you say beet. So that actually sounds the same. B-E-E-T sounds the same as B-E-A-T. However, originally it wasn't pronounced that way. It was pronounced bait with an A long vowel. And this gradually changed to this E vowel, so beat. And as you can see, the E has changed to IE. So, and actually the IE, it's actually gradually become IE. It was actually something like AE, and it's become IE. So there's been even more further um, shifting that has happened. So that's like in the word, what we would say bite now, ite, bite, right? Originally, this would be pronounced beta, beta, but it became bite. So that's an example of diphthongization. Um, from A to E is an example of raising. From E to I is an example of diphthongization. So those are some uh, things that happen. So the overview should give you a sense of what's going on there is what we call a chain shift, and that's happening from the lower vowels being raised to the higher vowels, and the highest vowels, e and u, being diphthongized to i and ow. So here, there's many ways to divide this up. This will hopefully simplify it. These are the phases of the great vowel shift. So the first phase that, and you can of course have multiple phases, and I'm really simplifying this. So um, you can you can read more and understand more by by looking at this from other scholars. But phase one of the great vowel shift is going from closed mid vowels. Um, so you have a and o, as you can see here, becoming e and u, as you saw in this previous slide. Um, yeah. And, uh, and then also you have diphthongization 
for E becoming A, or A, sorry, and the close vowel U becoming AU. Now I like to say close versus close. I know you can pronounce it either way. The reason I like to say close is because that's the opposite of uh, the verb for to open, so to close, and um, that's what's happening with your mouth when you're pronouncing these. So hopefully it helps people remember. So let's look at this first phase. Say you were in the 1400s and you wanted to say the word that we say now to bite. Well, you would say beat, as I've mentioned before, which became diphthongized as bait, bait, bait in about 1550, roughly. With meat, you have the word a in 1400, which would have been mate, and it became meat, very similar to the pronunciation that we use today. Out was pronounced with an u vowel, so that would have been oot, and it became out, which is also very similar to out that we use in, at least in American English today. Boot was pronounced boat, and that became pronounced very similar, again, to today's pronunciation in 1550 with boot. So phase one, we can come up with two hypotheses, at least, for the directionality and the uh, chain of events that happened. So did was it a push chain or was it a drag chain? And I will explain what those things are. In a push change, we see the close mid vowels, A and O, being raised first. And this pushes E and U to become the diphthongs. Okay, so that's one idea. Or did it happen the other way? Did E and U diphthongize first, and then to A and AU? Or, and then did that not cause a and O to be raised then and fill in those gaps to become E and U. So there's different theories on how this works and I'm not going to go into the details of that, but um, those are things to think about. Okay, now phase two. In phase two, we have two different periods. You have in what happened in 1500 to 1600, which the open vowel A was raised to A, and after 1600, where a was raised to e. So, and, and then also e was raised to a, and a was raised to o. So, we will take a look at these changes. Here you have in, the, in 1400 the word met, which is now the word meet. In 1500, it still was met, but by 1640, it became mate mate. And now we say meat, so it's gone even higher. You also had in 1400 the word for mate, which we pronounce the same as what you would pronounce in 1640 for the word meat. Mate was pronounced mat, or mot, I should say. In 1550 there was two pronunciations, there was mot and mat. But finally, by 1640, you have the word met. And by now, it has become mat. So, uh, or sorry, now it's become mate, so it's gone even higher. For the word boat, you have bought in 1400, which stayed the same by 1550. But by 1640, you had boat, or uh, sorry, um, yeah, boat. So, which is the same pronunciation as today, which is where we get our pronunciation for that. So already you can see the usefulness of knowing the vowel changes, that when I read the word for boat today, the reason it, it is O-A is because it's the A vowel, and it's reflecting that Middle English pronunciation. Okay, we're moving now to phase three. And phase three is all about mergers. So there were many different dialect variations and uh, vari variations of different words. So the pr they were, pronunciation was different. But this is actually ended up causing somewhat of a merger. So for example, these are four different dialect possibilities, all 
pronouncing these words at the same time. Number four is where we get the word for meat and meat. So M-E-E-T and M-E-A-T. And both of them today are pronounced with the I, with, with the I or what we would call the high vowel, E. So they're both meat. But um, if you had spoken in dialect three, it would have been meat and mate. Okay, which again, this reflects the long E vowel and this reflects, so A, that would be the, sorry, the E is in the International Phonetic Alphabet. So this is the A vowel, A, and this is E, met, right? Now, um, but this uh, makes us wonder, well, why is it that great and steak are not pronounced as greet and steak? right? Because it, that would be, that would make the most sense. Well, that's because we borrowed those words from dialect two. And so for those words, you have uh, the change that's gone to a for, for meat or, and also for great and steak also changed to steak instead of steak, it became steak instead of gret, it became great. And it did not change to over here to the E. So we borrowed that in in uh, most dialects, I would say, of English in America, at least, and in, um, also in received pronunciation as well. And later, it's changed from um, a monophthong A to A. So that's why you have the sound of, at least in, in American English, you have great and steak. So um, this helps us actually, because now we can understand why we have homophones like peace and peace, C and C, and T and T. So peace is in the pieces of things versus peace, like peace out, man, like cool. C versus C, I see something versus the sea, the ocean, and T, the thing that you golf off of versus T, the thing that you drink. And um, this goes directly to the fact that we had um, a different dialect that we borrowed from for those words. Okay, uh, one interesting thing is in Northern English and in Scots, some of these changes didn't happen and uh, different changes happened and they affected the way that the change shift happened. So for example, for the word house, so we in ended up in um, Southern English of Southern being the Southern of England English, not the southern United States, um, you have house. But in um, Middle English, as well as in um, Scots, it stayed the same so that it became hoos. Now, um, younger generation, the younger generation of northern uh, English speakers and Scots have been changing this gradually to ow, so that they do pronounce it now as ow. But if you talk to older, the older generation, it would be hoos. Um, a boot is actually an interesting one because, of course, it was boat before and it became boot, it became raised in uh, Southern English, but which is more like the received pronunciation or British English. But in Scots, this um, O sound became fronted. It became more front and it became an E sound. So it became boot, which then became boot, which then later became beat. So you would say it the same as the word for feet. You would say feet and beat. Put your feet in your beat, in your beats, I guess you'd say. And that's, that would be an old, the older way that um, Northern English or Scots. So if you went to Northern England or to Scotland, you might still hear some older people that say, put your feet in your beats instead of your feet in your boots. <laughs> okay. Um, there's several reasons we can propose uh, for the Great Vowel Shift. Maybe it was because of the migration that happened due to the pandemic of the 14th century. It could also have been the changes that happened. The aristocracy started speaking English instead of French. So none of these, of course, were planned, but uh, they can be a, ca a cause of this chain reaction or chain shift. So some brief conclusions. Um, this helps us. The Great Vowel Shift helps us understand words like tide, moon, and make. Why were these written this way? Well, it's because they reflect earlier pronunciations. You can also use the Great Vowel Shift to help you read 
some of the um, old texts. And this is just an example. This isn't actually an old text, but you can see some of the changes that went on in, in the language. For example, this is, is that a child, is that thy child? In Middle English, you would say, is that the child? And you can say in, in 1500 to 1650, it already changed to, is that they child? So you can already see that this ah uh, was raised to a, uh, so that it became from fat to that, which is the same pronunciation that we have today. Uh, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales start to make more sense. So, for example, in his Canterbury Tales on this line in the prologue, one Zephyrus eke with sweeta breath in spirit hath in every holt and heath. So this is breath and heath. Today we say breath and heath. Uh, we don't actually pronounce them the same. And uh, so it doesn't rhyme. But breath and heath do rhyme. So that's where, so you can see a rhyming and it sounds better in Chaucer's original. Now you can also just to see a summary of all of the changes that happened step by step. This is one way of looking at it across the time, how they have changed. And this is another way to look at them. Um, you can see if we had more time, we need to wrap up here, but if we had more time, we could go through each of the details of how these words have changed. Oh, look at that time. We're out of time. And yet it was team and it became team which became time, which became time, which became today's tame, team, sorry, <laughs> time, which became today's time. So um, you can see how these changes have happened over time, and that should help you in understanding some of the spelling and the differences in spelling and why it might be confusing when you use uh, English spelling, which is based probably on a lot of spellings that would reflect pronunciations about 400 years ago. So that's all the time we have today. Um, and I'm looking forward to any questions that you might have.